Thank you. Thank you, Eugene, and uh, thank you for the Coleman Center, uh, which was, is a wonderful institution and uh, also gave me an advanced look at this great book. Um, it is a great book. Um, I, uh, it was a thrill to be asked to do this with Greg tonight. Um, I come at it, he comes at it as a historian, I come at it as a reader uh, of uh, his book, but also as a, as a um, reader of Melville, and it seems kind of suiting, well fitting that we should be meeting in the New York Public Library to talk about, I think unambiguously, the greatest New Yorker who ever lived, uh, Melville. <laughs> I don't think anybody swims in his wake. Um, and, uh, and to talk also about the much larger story uh, that uh, he was expanding upon uh, in it. And um, uh, Greg asked me uh, to do the honors of, of talking for a minute at the outset about just laying out the story of Benito Serena, which I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with and many of you may not have read as recently. Uh, and, and so um, I thought I would do that. And uh, I remember seeing a documentary once about Pablo Casals and he was playing, he, he, he played Bach every day and he said, I always play a little Bach in the morning. It's like a benediction on the house. And I think um, of, of reading a little Melville aloud that way too. Um, so it's a benediction on the house. Benito Serena is the story of the American sea captain, Amasa Delano, who uh, fetches up uh, as a seal on a sealing ship uh, at the end of a, a long uh, expedition as the sealing uh, is running out. Uh, that is to say, they're running out of seals to kill. Um, and Greg will talk about sealing. Um, and he's uh, in Latin, uh, off, the, off the coast of, uh, where exactly would? Uh, off the coast of Chile. Chile, yeah. basically. And he uh, sees this uh, derelict looking ship uh, in, a, in a cove and uh, approaches it. And um, this appears in his memoirs, the story. And Mel Melville took the story from uh, Delano's uh, memoir and, um, and he uh, expanded upon it in his own way. And basically the story is that he, he went aboard a ship. Uh, he, he saw this ship that looked in trouble, was aware that it could be a trick, that it, it, maybe it was a ship that was going to try to be, a, that was a pirate ship or some sort of a ship that was going to try to ambush him, pretending to be derelict by the, the side of the road, as it were. And, um, and, and he went there, but also thought maybe they need help, brought water, brought pumpkins, brought uh, a good <laughs> catch of fish. Um, he was a, a proper New England Yankee. And he went there and, and he went on board and um, uh, thought that what he was seeing was a, a ship which had uh, run into all kinds of trouble and where the um, slaves, it was a slave trading ship, he saw that right away. What he didn't realize uh, from the outset was that this was a ship where there had been a mutiny, a, a slave rebellion, and that the slaves had uh, risen up and uh, killed a great deal of the uh, the, well, the slave trader and a, a lot of the uh, white people on board, and demanded to be returned uh, whence they'd come, which was uh, West Africa, Senegal. They were asking to go back to in the, in the book, but uh, they, they, they'd been loaded on in the Gulf of uh, Bonny off Nigeria at the end of the Niger Basin. And um, they wanted to go back to Africa. And uh, this uh, had ended up in a standoff. And when they saw this Captain Delano approaching, they created a masquerade. And in this masquerade, uh, they pretended, even though the slaves were now in control of the ship and the white captain, Benito Serino, was their prisoner, they pretended that it was still the other way around. And they propped up this fading man who was their prisoner and played the sort of servile uh, uh, slave uh, attendant to him, but also controlled the thing. And the whole time Delano was on board, he uh, imagined well, isn't this just remarkable? The slave Babo, you know, is so, is so wonderfully attentive. And imagine being served by such a person. He was a New England abolitionist in principle, but he thought, you know, this is just, this is just such a fine relationship. And look at how careful he is. And, and, and everything that was amiss that he slightly picked up, um, he sort of attributed to the idea that maybe this really was an ambush after all. And maybe Benito Serino was the sinister guy after all. And it's only at the very uh, late stage of the drama of the, his long day aboard that ship. So I thought I would just read you for a second uh, a, a little sense of how Melville approaches this. He, he describes the ship, 1799, Captain Amasa Delano of Buxbury in Massachusetts there with his sealer. The morning was one peculiar to that coast. Everything was mute and calm, everything gray. 
The sea, though undulated into long roods of swells, seemed fixed and was sleeked at the surface like waved lead that is cooled and set in the smelter's mold. The sky seemed to grace her too. Flights of troubled grave fowl, kith and kin with flights of troubled grave vapors among which they were mixed, skimmed low and fitfully over the waters as swallows over meadows before storms. Shadows present, foreshadowing deeper shadows to come. He made it very easy for English professors in future years. <laughs> Considering the lawlessness and loneliness of the spot and the sort of stories at that day associated with those seas, Captain Delano's surprise might have deepened into some uneasiness had he not been a person of a singularly undistrustful good nature, not liable, except on extraordinary and repeated incentives, and hardly then to indulge in personal alarms any way involving the imputation of malign evil in man. Whether, in view of what humanity is capable, such a trait implies, along with a benevolent heart, more than ordinary quickness and accuracy of intellectual perceptions may be left to the wise to determine. So he sets it up very much as uh, Delano's uh, sunny view of humanity, blinding him to the reality of a slave rebellion of, uh, of what's going on. And, that, um, and throughout the book that runs as a theme, um, I will go now and leap towards the very end where having found out what happened and he's sort of saved Benito Serena, there's this extraordinary exchange uh, where he is with Benito uh, and, and Benito, he's sort of saying, you know, you saved my life, and, and, but, but really Captain Delano says, well, but you saved mine, uh, you know, because imagine it had all gone awry. Imagine I had been more suspicious and acted accordingly why these slaves could have, would have had my head in a second and would have killed me like that. So really by maintaining the deception, you saved my life just as much as I ultimately, by you unmasking the deception, saved yours. And they're in the boat, and, uh, and Don Benito is not very persuaded by any of this. And he says, you, you generalize Don Benito, and mournfully enough, but the past is past. Why moralize upon it? Forget it. See, yon bright sun has forgotten it all, and the blue sea and the blue sky, these have turned over new leaves. Because they have no memory, he dejectedly replied. Because they are not human. But these mild trades that now fan your cheek, says Delano, do they not come with a human-like healing to you? Warm friends, steadfast friends are the trades. With their steadfastness, they but waft me to my tomb, senor was the foreboding response. <laughs> you are saved, cried Captain Delano, more and more astonished and pained. You're saved. What has cast such a shadow upon you? The Negro. And some of you may be familiar with that passage as the um, epigraph also to uh, Ralph Ellison's The Invisible Man. So it's an extraordinary story. Uh, Melville, towards the end, also, uh, in his odd way, disappears into, he sort of hands the whole narrative over to these um, fictional depositions uh, in which uh, Benito Serino tells his whole story himself from his perspective, but as if in legal uh, documents translated from some court. How did you get into this? I mean, you ended up reading the real documents. There was a real slave revolt. This was a real captain. There's a real story. How did you find this? How did you expand upon it? And well, there, 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 was, the there was a real, I mean, there really wasn't a Massa Delano, there really was a Babo, there really was a Benito Sereno. And I, I came to the story when I was teaching a class in uh, U.S. Latin American history, and actually a friend of mine who's in the audience, uh, Corey Robin, suggested that I assign Benito Sereno, the, no, the novel, the novella, and I hadn't read it before. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and I read it, and I assigned it, and it was, a, it, you know, it's just, uh, I, as, as you conveyed, it's this fascinating, it's, Gothic on the high seas. It's it's you know it's um you know almost as if you know this New England sea captain was kind of lost you know all of a sudden captured by the Bronte sisters and <laughs> lost in the, you know and 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 it takes place all in, in through the world view, through the perspective of a and Readers don't know that the West Africans are in charge until until Melville reveals it in charge. And I was preparing to teach the class, um, and I was reading around about the novella, and it turns out literary scholars have known that it was based on chapter 18 of Amasa Delano's uh, novel, uh, memoir for quite a while. This is not a new thing, that it's actually a, a true story, but there, there, has, there was Which no- Which was a fairly like, 
popular sea captain's account of his ramblings it wasn't around the world? It, was, it wasn't that popular. It didn't sell. Mm -hmm. it, it, but um, but it, was, it was out there. I mean, there the, the, was a bunch of, uh, you know, the memoirs.